Welcome to the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio from Boise, Idaho. This is your host, Adam Graham. If you have a comment, email it to me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives and check us out on Instagram. Instagram.com slash Great Detectives. If you are enjoying this program, I encourage you to follow us using your favorite podcast software. Today's program is provided by RadioArchives.com. And if you send an email to Radio Archives at Detectives at RadioArchives.com, they will send you an email with links to download a free high quality old time radio set a free Pulp Fiction reprint ebook and a free Pulp Fiction audiobook. In addition, uh, there's a special offer. Radio Archives is offering my listeners for their transcription transfers subscription. Over the course of 23 years, Radio Archives has released thousands of programs fully restored and sold through their store. However, these are just a small portion of the 36,000 transcription disc that they've digitized over the past 23 years. They have set up a subscription service where subscribers can get access to digital versions of all 36,000 discs released in batches of 600 every month for 60 months. I got the first months and was really impressed by the variety and quality. To be sure, there were some common programs included, such as Abbott and Costello, X-1, Suspense, and Broadway's My Beat. And as direct transfers, these tended to have better sound quality than so many versions of these programs that you'll find online that have gone through so many different transfers and copies, but also included some rarer programs as well. I listened to some episodes of Voice of the Army, a pilot for a comedic soap opera, and a local music program that aired on black radio stations back during the golden age of radio. The first month was just a tremendous treat with so many programs and such great history that I'm eagerly awaiting what's to come in months ahead. And Radio Archives is making an offer to listeners of the podcast who'd like to join me in receiving these programs. Typically, after the initial sign-up period, the cost is set at $120 per month. However, listeners to the great detectives of old time radio can receive a 50% discount and, and pay only $60 per month. And you can do that by going to transfers.greatdetectives.net. That's transfers.greatdetectives.net or clicking the link that is provided in the show notes. And you can learn full details. And I do want to let you know that we do receive commission on signups through this link. But now let's get into this week's episode of Philo Vance. The original air date on this one is April the 11th, 1950, and the title is The Nylon Murder Case. Why, you now little twerp, you I'll break it, break it up, darling. Yes, now break it up. But I, I said break it up. Oh. Sure enough gets excited, doesn't she, Grace? Uh, oh, why don't you both stop? I won't have you two fighting, do you understand? Yeah. Only why you brought her in with us, I'll never know. There must be so many things you'll never know, dearie. Why pick on little old me? There she goes again, starting in. Oh, for heaven's that sake. phony accent and that phony blonde hair. Oh, I... the girl carries on. Now that's enough. Oh, both of you listen to me. Oh, she's such a Doris. Yeah. You know, I uh, like the way you've been operating. Why? 
Thanks. You look good. You talk good. And you've uh, managed to crash a lot of society parties that paid off. Well? Well, we've been able to fence the stuff you've lifted, Doris, but what do we get for it? Only half of what it's worth. Well, what? So let's skip that kind of petty stuff. Well, what do we do instead? Well, I've got something big on the fire. Very big. <laughs> that the reason you imported this? I sure wish she'd leave poor little old me alone. Now, Doris, I've told oh, you... Oh, I'm sorry, Grace, but... Look, let me do one more job, will you? What's that? There's a blonde mink coat belonging to a Mrs. Williams that I want for myself. It'll be a cinch to grab, and I want it. Mrs. Marilyn Williams? That's right. Oh, <laughs> well, you can never get into her house. Why, it's guarded better than Fort Knox. Oh, I've got a way. All right to try it? Okay. Go ahead. Sure. Go ahead. Maybe you'll get caught, and then Grace and I wouldn't be bothered with you all. Oh, that did it. <laughs> Grace, what's she doing here? Who is she, and what do we need this baby-faced dame for? Tell her, Gracie. Doris. Yeah. This um, baby-faced dame is Sally Jo Russell. Well, I've told you that we were going to branch out, and uh, we're going to need her. I brought her here because she's wanted. <laughs> Not by me. No. No, not by you. By the police. For murder. All right, come on, come on. What are you waiting for? Let's get this traffic moving. Ah, get that car moving. No parking on this street. Hey, hey, lady. Look out, look out. All right, all right. Let me through here. Let me through. She's hurt pretty bad, officer. I guess I... Yeah. I, 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 I... Yeah, I'll, I'll take care of her. She ran right in front of your car. I saw it. Yeah, I couldn't help hitting her. I stopped as yes, soon as I... Yes, I know, I know. All right, back up, everybody. I'm going to carry this girl into that big house there and phone for an ambulance. All right, all right, back up. Uh, give me some room. I'm coming through. Yes, I know. You know, do you? That's fine, you know. What's that supposed to do, make me happy? I don't know. You know, you don't know. Fine satisfaction I'm getting from you. You're a district attorney. Fighting crime is your responsibility. I'm only responsible for seeing that guilty individuals are convicted. Now, don't trade words with me, Markham. I've got connections, good political connections, as you well know. Yes, I... I've been victimized. All my friends have been victimized. There's a well-organized gang of thieves operating... You'll only let me... And you're doing nothing about it. I want something done. Yes, I know you do. Well, then do something about it, or you're here about it. Goodbye. Ah, uh, do something about it, just like that. Fine, fine. Uh, Philo Vance speaking. This is Markham Vance. Oh, well, my friend, things can't be that bad. That is a matter of opinion. <laughs> I'm having some pressure put on me, and I don't know exactly what to do about it. How can I help? Listen, Vance. Yes? There's been a series of robberies of socially prominent people in this city. Generally, furs, jewelry, and any cash lying around have been taken. Yes. The robberies, in most cases, have taken place while parties were going on. According to my information, it's possible that one or several of the female guests are part of an organized gang. Can you do anything about this, Vance? You certainly haven't given me too much to work on. That never stopped you before. Does it bother you now? On the contrary, it gives me added incentive. That's good. You seem to think a female gang is operating. Well, then the idea for me is to chercher la femme. All I can say, Vance, is happy share shame. Like this coat, Grace? Yeah. Get a look at the bag. Mm, it's pretty, Doris. Oh, I always wanted one. Too good for whoever's wearing it, if you ask me. And nobody's asked you, Southern now Comfort. Now stop it, but both I... of you, before you get started. Okay. We've got some things to talk over. Uh-huh. Look, Doris. Yeah. I, uh... Let you pull that job where you got the coat. But from now on, no more working solo. Well, I thought I did a pretty clever job. I pretended to get hit by a car, was carried into Mrs. Williams' house, and then while the cop was phoning for an ambulance, I grabbed the coat and went out the French windows. Seems to me the cop could describe you pretty well. But of course, what would little old me know? <laughs> little old you would know nothing. Hmm. 
kept my arm over my face when he carried me into the house. I wore a blonde wig. Oh, fine description he'll be able to give. Oh, you probably did something stupid. Darling. Grace, I've taken all I can from this dame. I'm going to tear her apart little well, by you're little. you're mighty welcome to try. My, oh, my hair. Let go of my hair. Oh, let go. I'll rip it out. Get up at you, too. I'll you stop her when stop I scratch it. my name on her face, you little twerp. You up. Pop. Break it up. Break no, it up if I ever get this gun out of oh, my hand bag. Don't move there. I'll there. Get it. You give it to oh. me. Give oh, me you. that gun. No. There. All right, now, both of you. I said stop, and I mean stop. She tried to kill me. She tried to shoot me. You that think little... I'm going to stand there and get scalped? All right, no, I won't have any more of this. I'll fix you. It's got to stop once and for all. Because we've got a job to do. A job all three of us are needed for. Yeah? And it's a big job. The biggest we've ever tried. Now, listen to me. Hmm. I'll listen, Grace. But are you sure you and I couldn't do this job alone? <laughs> How many more times do, do I have to push these pedals? Oh, please continue, oh. Mrs. Williams. It is excellent for the oh. figure. Already oh. I can see an improvement. Oh, I'm tired. Pushing these pedals and throwing no place isn't my idea of fun. Oh, oh give me a massage, Florette. Yes, Mrs. Williams. <sighs> if you will come over here to the table and uh, lie down. Oh, best suggestion you've made all day. Oh, oh. Yeah. oh, how's that? Oh, that is fine. Uh, now I cover you with this sheet, uh, and mm. I work on your shoulders first. Mm. Mm. Oh, mm. hand me that box of chocolates, Florette. Oh, but Mrs. Williams, your figure. Oh, I've got to give you something to work off, don't I? Oh, chocolates, please. Oh. Here you are. Thank you. Mm, you look good. Mmm. Mm, I, I wonder if the police found that girl who stole my fur coat. We would have heard, I'm sure. Mm, I guess that's right. Oh, who could that be? I find out. I will be right back. Um, no, I have to hurry on my account. I'm enjoying myself. Mmm. Well, who was it for it? I do not know yet. Mmm. Yes? Well, who was it? Wait here. Um, it was um. a man outside. His name is Philo Vance. Mm -hmm. The butler told him you were up here, so he came up. Mm, what was that name again? Philo Vance. Mm. He is private investigator. Mm -hmm. He read about your coat being stolen, and he wishes to talk to you about it. Mm. <laughs> is he attractive? Oh, yes, madame. Very. Oh, let him come in by all means. Yes. Mm. 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 Hello, Mrs. Williams. I'm Philo Vance. How do you do, Mr. Vance? Chocolate? No, thank you. You don't mind if I have... Oh, go right ahead. Thank you. Mm. Mrs. Williams, mm. your fur coat was stolen. Mm -hmm. A woman faked an accident, was carried in here, and she took the coat and disappeared while the policeman was calling for an ambulance. Mm. You, you read about it in newspapers? Yes. Will you tell me what the woman looked like? I haven't the slightest idea. I never saw her. Policeman carried her into my room, left her there to make the phone call. By the time he came to tell me I had company, she, <laughs> she'd vanished. I see. I thought perhaps you might be of some help, but apparently I was wrong. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, can I get you something to make up for it? No, thank you very much. I have my massages at the club. Um, oh, Vance, there is something I didn't tell the police that maybe you'd like to know. Yes? No. A woman, whoever she was, took a pair of stockings that belonged to me. In addition to the coat, she left a souvenir of one torn stocking of her own. She left one stocking here? Mm -hmm, that's right. Well, I'll have Florette get it for you if you like. Yes, it's indeed. Rip, but it might mean something to you. It certainly might, Mrs. Williams. Mm -hmm. When she left her one stocking, our thief made her one mistake. <laughs> Sit down, Vance. Glad to see you. Thank you, Mark. I dropped in to report a little progress in the case you asked me to work on. How little? Very at the moment. But look at this stocking. Here. Uh, looks just like a stocking to me. It's ripped, but 
What's it supposed to tell me? I'll tell you what it tells me. It will help me describe the girl who stole Mrs. Williams' fur coat and who might well be part of the gang that you're looking for. Please go ahead and do your describing. The girl is slender, tall, particularly fastidious about her clothes, has a disciplined mind, and is a brunette, I believe. You know that from this stocking? Vance. It's true. Notice the length of the stocking marker, man, the size. Yes. It's marked 11. That's very large. Indicates the wearer had a large foot. Hence, I believe she's tall. Now, what's this about being fastidious in her dress? She took the time to steal a pair of stockings from Mrs. Williams' room, even though she was in a hurry to get out, because she didn't want to be seen on the street with a ripped stocking. Uh Uh-huh. And why is she a brunette? Because the policeman who picked her up said she was a blonde. The woman was careful to shield her face. The blonde hair was obviously used as a decoy. Hmm. I agree with everything so far. But you claim she has a well-disciplined mind. Yes. How can you possibly say that? The fact that she left only the ripped stocking at Mrs. Williams' house. Markham, she took with her the other stocking she was wearing. What good will one stocking do her? And how does that explain that she had an orderly and well-trained mind? I'll let you know as soon as I know whether I'm right or not. At the moment, I'm going to see whether or not I can find her. And only one thing disturbs me about that. And that is? I haven't the slightest idea where to look. Well, Doris, that's a very pretty fire, don't you think? If you like fires... Most beautiful fire I ever did see. I did a mighty fine job starting it. <laughs> Those firemen will never get it under control. Would you like to know why I think it's a pretty fire? Not especially. I have a pretty good idea. You have? Now, who would ever guess it? Sally, someday oh, I... why don't you both stop? Oh, she said this that. is no time for fighting. We should be celebrating. Why? That fire means we're out of the penny ante business of stealing furs and jewelry and selling them to fences. Oh. We're in a new business, a big business, the three of us. Gracie, darling, like I said once before, when you mention the three of us, it always occurs to me that you're including one too many. This is District Attorney Markham. The case we're working on concerns a series of robberies in wealthy homes, done, we believe, by a group of women. Philo Vance is working on the case, but his only result so far is a description he has of one of the members of the gang, a description obtained from a ripped nylon stocking. The last day or so has resulted in no new developments, but the gang is still active, we believe, although we don't know how or where. It might be... Yes, sir. Mr. Abbott will see you now, miss. Oh, thank you. Uh, you wait here, Sally. Show sure enough, Grace. I'll wait right here, honey. I've got me a magazine and all the time. All right. <laughs> oh, hello, Mr. Abbott. Well, come in. Come in. Hey, sit down. All right. Well, has our enterprise concluded successfully? Oh, yes, yes. Quite. Good fire. Very good fire. Glad you liked it. No, there remains only one little detail. The matter of... Oh, uh, just a moment, please. Yes? Will you want anything more tonight, Mr. Abbott? Oh, I know. Uh, you can leave now if you like. Thank you. Good night. Good night. <laughs> My secretary. So I imagine. Uh, Mr. Abbott. Uh, yes? I was about to say that there remained only one detail of that little job we did for you. Oh, so? You uh, gave us a deposit. We set the fire. You collect the insurance. Now we want our money. 20000 was the balance. Was it? Oh, now, don't get cute. Well, is there something you think you might do about it if I refuse to pay you the rest of the money? Don't forget, you committed the crime. You arranged for me to do it. Yes, I wonder how you'd ever prove that. <laughs> good day, Miss Dillon. Wait a minute. I said good day. Hmm. Uh, just wait one moment, would you please, Mr. Abbott? What do you want me to wait for? You'll find out. Sally? Yes? Come in here a minute, will you? I sure enough will. What is it, honey? Sally. Yes? Mr. Abbott doesn't think he has to pay us the money he promised for setting the fire. Oh, he doesn't. Convince him, Sally. Now, look here. Neither of you can threaten me. I could put you both in... That gun. I don't think he's convinced, Sally. He's talking about putting us in jail. He is? 
well, I declare. <laughs> <laughs> Wasn't he the silliest man? Abbott's office was on the second floor of this building, Vance. It's easier to walk up than wait for the elevator. Well, it's fine with me, Markham. But you've been shot twice, eh? And the cleaning woman found him dead. That's right. Our homicide department checked with his secretary, but after telling us that there were two women in the office when she left and mentioning some other minor details, she got hysterical. All I hope is that one of the girls fits the description I gave you, Markham. The one I got from the ripped nylon stocking. Vance, this is one of the few times you were completely wrong. Of course, it's possible the two women in the office had nothing to do with our gang, or for that matter, with the shooting. But neither of them, according to the secretary, looked even remotely like the woman you described. That's nice and complicating, if not exactly complimentary. One thing more, Markham. Did the secretary know either of the two women in the office? No, and here's the strange thing. She said they were obviously there by appointment, but she never called them. Hmm. Yeah, let's go in. Hello, Collins. Oh, hi, D.A. Hello, Mr. Vance. Hello, Collins. Mr. Vance and I want to go into Mr. Abbott's private office. Well, go right ahead, D.A. The body's been removed, but nothing's been touched. The homicide men left everything the way it was. Thank you. Why the puzzled expression, Vance? The women were here by appointment, but the secretary didn't make the appointment. That hmm. means something? It might. I want to take a look in Abbott's desk. Oh, here it is. Hmm. What are you looking for? A book with telephone numbers in it, private phone numbers, if there is such a thing. And there certainly should be. There generally is. Yes, here we are. It's the book, but it seems to be blank. Wait a minute. As you were going through those pages, I thought I saw some writing toward the middle of the book. Go oh. back a bit, would you, Vance? Yes, sir. I hope you're right. Might be a very important thing if you were. Uh, there, Vance, right there on that page. Oh, yes. Uh, five phone numbers, no names or addresses, just five numbers. Well... What do we do now? Now we do two things, Markham. We call every one of those numbers, and we hope one of them will lead us to those two women. Wait a minute. Well, who are you? Hello, my name is Vance. Philo Vance. May I come well, in? I don't know. Well, thank you. What do you want? Some information. May I sit down? <laughs> Thank you. You uh, take an awful lot for granted. Yes, don't I? Your name is Grace Dilling, isn't it? I found your phone number. You think there's a reward for returning it? The only reward I expect is satisfaction. I think... Who was it at the door? Oh, company. Come in, please. My name is Vance. I'm glad to see you. Very glad. Tall, dark, slender, very well dressed. Well, what's hmm? with this individual, Grace? What does he want? I don't know, but I'm going to find out fast. Now, look, you uh, forced yourself in here. Force yourself to leave, Where is, will you? Where is that dame? I'll kill her. Grace, is that door staying in there with you? Oh. Sally! I don't care We've who we got... We've got company. Oh, I don't care who we got. If she's in there, I'm going to give her a talk. Go on over. She'll never... Well, forever more. <laughs> How are you all, sir? Well, that was a quick transition, if ever I saw one. Uh, look, Vance, don't make me get tough. Oh? This is my house. You've got no right here. I uh, could throw you out and be perfectly justified. You know that, don't you? I also know you're big enough to do it. Oh, I'd hate to think you meant anything personal in that remark. Your uh, hat's right there on the table, Vance. Goodbye. Sorry your visit was so short and uneventful. Don't be silly, Miss Dilling. I got everything I came here for. How are you making out with that window, Vance? I can handle it, I think. The trick is to do it without making too much noise. All three of the women are downstairs. I know, we saw them through the window. <laughs> I got down here as soon as I could after you phoned me. Here we are. This window would squeak, wouldn't it? I don't think anybody heard it. Go on into the room, Vance. This ladder is shaky. I'm practically in. There. Come on in, Markham. I'll give you a hand. There we are. Made it. Here's the flashlight, Vance. Throw the beam at the dresser drawer. That's it, Markham. Now, if we're in the right room, the room of the girl called Doris, this case is almost over. Well, this is her room, all right. Here are a couple of letters to Doris Taylor, this address... There's a single bed in the room, so she stays here alone. I'm proud of you, Markham. Now look for some stockings. Stockings? Yes, they won't be in this drawer. 
Oh, what's in this box? It looks like the stocking box my wife has at home. Well, that's what it is. I told you the girl had a well-disciplined mind. Stocking box proves it. Mm -hmm. Six pair of stockings, Markham. None of them new, and all of them rolled up. Uh, this roll looks larger to me than the others. That's what I was hoping to find. Unroll it, Markham, and you'll find three stockings, not two. Well, That uh, doesn't prove these girls are the ones we're looking for, but it's enough to set the stage for a little scene I think you'll enjoy. Doris, you what? no good double-crossing Dane. This is the time you get it. Get out of my room, Sally. I'll get out, but you'll stay in here permanently. Look at this note. Look at it. What's that in your other hand? It's a knife, sweetheart, and it's going to be all yours in a minute. What? So you were going to tip the cops off to me, were you? Tip you were the... going to tell them I killed Abbott. What are you talking about? Stop playing innocent. A kid brought this note back, said somebody in this house gave it to him to take to headquarters. He described You're you. You're crazy. Kid said he lost the car fare you gave him, came back for more. I saw the note was addressed to the cop, so I opened it and read it. I never wrote any letter. This is a trick. That's your story. Grace isn't here to protect you now. This is the last stop for you, kid. You get off right here. You get away from me. Don't come near me with that knife. You'd rattle the whole setup, would you? Tell them all about you and me and Grace and the jobs we pulled. Then try and cop a plea so they'd go easy on you. I didn't, I tell you. Sure, that's what you say. Okay. I'll play your way. <laughs> go ahead. Break up the house. Keep throwing lamps. I'll remember to duck. <clears throat> You can't walk back much further, Doris. This is something I've wanted to do for a long... Oh, my hair! You let go of my hair! Kill me, would but you? I'll not... show you who'll I kill! I can't free no, you won't, you little... Stop this! You... I'll get you! All right, you. break it up. Get away, Jerry! Let's go! 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 let us go 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 let when Grace comes back, we'll pick her up, and then I'll tell you how a stocking gave this young lady away. Or, in other words, how the hose turned on her. Begin with, Markham, when Doris left Mrs. Williams' house, she took with her one stocking. You want to know why? I certainly do. That's the general idea of this, isn't it? After all, the case is over. I have my confessions. Grace and her gang not only killed Abbott, but were responsible for all those society robberies. Now, tell me about this, Doris. You remember I said she had a well-disciplined mind? Yes. She was in a hurry at Mrs. Williams' house, but she remembered to take the one good stocking with her. Why? Uh, that's where I came in on that why, remember? Because she had another pair, the same shade and quality at her house. Most women buy two pairs of stockings of the same shade and quality, so that if anything happens to one stocking, they have a pair and a replacement for that pair. Follow? Yes, yes, I do now. Doris thought of that even when she was in a hurry to leave the Williams house with Mrs. Williams' fur coat. Right. Now we get on a little further. Mm -hmm. We found five numbers in Abbott's book. You called all five, found a legitimate connection between Abbott and four of the numbers. So I went to call on the name and address of the fifth. I know you did, but what happened there that let you set the trap? I found there was a big feud going on between Doris and Sally. I knew Doris wasn't at Abbott's office. His secretary didn't describe her, remember? So I thought of the note idea, hired a neighborhood boy, and told him what story to tell Sally when he brought the note back to the house. Who wrote that note? My secretary, Ellen. Got a big kick out of it, too. <laughs> well, I guess there's nothing more to tell you, Markham, except that finding that third nylon in Doris' stocking box after you and I climbed in the window confirmed my theories, and we were there later when Sally brought in Ellen's note. That's right. You actually broke the case after we got to the top of the ladder. Yes, after we got to the top of the ladder, we came to the end of the nylon murder case. <laughs> Thank you.
Welcome back. There are a number of things I have to say about this episode. First of all, let's just be clear that in committing, breaking, and entering, Vance literally called the DA over to hold the ladder and to be his accomplice. I mean, this type of thing is not uh, beneath or typical radio private eye, but maybe give the district attorney a little bit of plausible deniability by not directly involving him in your crime. Also, I did find it curious that Vance was sure that the thief was a brunette because she had been wearing a blonde wig. Uh, don't redheads exist in this world, or are they just... So rare in the Philo Vance universe that it's not even considered because redheads make up 2% of the population. Although Philo Vance isn't the only crime show to pretend that the choice in hair is blonde or brunette, which is kind of a weird approach. As much as I hate to agree with Sally, she did have a point. What exactly did Doris add to the new arson for hire business model? I, I guess I've, arson for hire has probably never been described as a business model. But be that as it may, Grace was the one who made the contacts and made the plans. And Sally was the person who set the fires and was the gun-toting, psychopathic enforcer. There's no practical job in this for Doris. Her presence just sets up catfights between her and Sally. Well, that plus, I guess, having three people involved makes it seem more like a gang than two. Although, you know, as I look into it, there's not a numerical limit on how many members you have to have to have a criminal gang. But my position is, if you don't have enough criminals to play a bridge game, you don't really have a gang. You have three gals up to no good. Not an organized gang, as Markham said. And speaking of Markham, it was interesting to have him acknowledge what his appropriate role was, which is prosecuting criminals. But it seems in that conversation with the citizen that he was trying to have it both ways. If you're going to be the district attorney that micromanages every single homicide investigation or any major crime investigation, you can't complain when prominent citizens lean on you for action and pretend that, oh, I'm just a district attorney. I don't actually do anything other than prosecute. Uh, another thing, I actually think that Sally as this Southern Belle gun-toting psychopath was an interesting idea. They made a weird decision in having her not actually be a Southern Belle, but the accent be a fake. And this is something, I think, that we talked about it way back in the Rumba murder case, where sometimes this show has people use fake accents for no reason. It might make sense for her to use a fake accent around Philo Vance, but around her own criminal associates, it doesn't make a lick of sense. However, on a positive note, I do want to praise Mrs. Williams' credo when she was talking to her trainer and offered the reason for eating chocolates that she needed something for her trainer to burn off. I think that is a perfectly reasonable explanation, and a lot of us can identify with it. All right, listener comments and feedback now. And we have a comment from Stephen, who writes, My wife sometimes listens to my podcast in the background. As soon as they discovered the body, she said the secretary did it. I told her the secretary hadn't been given a motive. I then told her how I thought the murder was committed. 
A few minutes later, I had to tell her I was wrong. Markham had just suggested my solution, and Markham is never right. Markham and I were wrong about the method, and my wife was right about the killer. Well, thanks so much, Stephen. As much as I like to dunk on Markham, the fact is, even when you have a solid side character, whether you're talking about Watson from Sherlock Holmes, or Mark Donovan from Frank Race, or Brooksy from Let George Do It, or Phyllis from Michael Shane, anytime some character who is not the detective suggests your solution, you know that you were wrong. Because they're not the star of the show. The one exception to this are those programs that tried to be smarter by having the police be right from the beginning sometimes. But yeah, when you hear your solution from the side character, you know that that is generally not it. Then we have a comment from Mark on YouTube who writes, Thank you for all you've done for me as I'm approaching 70 and wouldn't know Facebook from Tic-Tac-Toe. Well, thank you so much, Mark. Then there's a comment. Uh, this one was left on the Twice Told Tale episode. Uh, thank you for sharing this. I never want these recordings to be forgotten. It's such a window into the past on so many different levels. Well, thank you so much, Justin, and appreciate your comment. Now it's time to thank our Patreon supporter of the day. Thank you to Alice, Patreon supporter since April of 2021, Currently supporting us at the Detective Sergeant level of $7.14 or more per month. Thank you so much for your support, Alice. And that will actually do it for today. If you are enjoying this podcast, I encourage you to follow us using your favorite podcast software. And if you're enjoying the podcast on YouTube, be sure to like the video, subscribe to the channel, and mark the notification bell. All those great things that can help the channel and the podcast grow. We'll be back next Thursday with another episode of Philo Vance. But join us back here tomorrow for the final three parts of the Henderson matter where... Connor's with the Adjustment Agency. Yeah. You see, Mr. Dollar, it's like this. I've been over in Jackson Hole for five days now hunting duck. We were way in and I didn't hear about Henderson's death until I got back yesterday. Uh Uh-huh. Now... Uh, Look, Mr. Dollar, I don't know what reflection this will have on your attitude toward this case, but two days before I left, Mr. Henderson telephoned me here in Great Falls. He said he wanted to change the beneficiary on his policy. Oh, in other words, he was going to cut his wife out? Yes, I suppose so. I know they weren't getting along. There'd been talk of divorce. Yes, I guess so. Uh Uh-huh. Did he name a new beneficiary? Yes, a schoolteacher in Culver named Matilda Knickerbocker. Everybody calls her Maddie. What was his connection with her? None that I know of. I think it was just a name for him to throw in until he could decide on another beneficiary why he didn't have Wait a minute. Maddie Knickerbocker. Just a school teacher. Everybody knows her. He was awful mad when he talked to me that day. I could tell it in his voice. Now, here's what might interest you just a little more. The day I left on my hunting trip, Mr. Henderson phoned me again. He said to never mind. Mrs. Henderson was still his beneficiary. Had you changed the policies yet? No. Are you sure it was Henderson who telephoned you? Well, yes, of I I think it was him. Do you remember when you got the call? Somewhere around noon, a little later, I guess. He died between 12.30 and 1. And it must have been just before he fell out the window. He phoned you long distance from cover, huh? Yes, sir. Well, he was supposed to have been in the hotel all morning, so he had to phone from his room. Well, you can check that, can't you? (laughs) You'd be surprised how hard it is to check simple things like that around the Butte Hotel. Did you know Henderson very well, Mr. Thurber? He was a customer. I wrote a lot of insurance for him. Know his wife? Oh, yes. I hope you'll be with us then. In the meantime, do send your comments to box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives and check us out on Instagram, instagram.com slash greatdetectives. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham, signing off.